We have an hour of a lot of information and um, I presented this similar uh, content, uh, a, a longer version of it yesterday and a few weeks before to other entities and other uh, firms. But um, the, the amount of good feedback that I got is amazing. And this is why I stick to this content because it's really relevant to any business owner, especially lawyers, small law firms and uh, small, medium-sized law firms, and anybody can learn from it. So I just want to start by saying that um, yeah, I'm a business owner. I own an IT and cybersecurity company. And I mention that not uh, because I want to sell anything. This is not a sales presentation at all. It's because when you hear some of the recommendations and some of the stories and some of the, the um, uh, feedback that I'll give you on behalf of what happens around the world, or our world at least, is from firsthand experience of stuff that we run into on a regular basis. I spend a lot of time researching and talking and, and analyzing and uh, creating uh, the big picture for our clients and for the legal community, because I really believe that if you don't know what you're up against, it's really impossible to protect yourself against it. Or you can just spend tons of money and hiring people to do it for you, and you never, you never know if they're doing a good job or not. So again, I, I want to real quick introduce myself and um, this is who I am and that's it. That's all you're going to get from me. Um, let's dive in. There are a lot of areas in uh, our lives where risk can come from these days. Um, the, the, w one of the weirdest examples is actually a casino that got hacked through a fish tank thermometer. That is not new, but... It happened still, and it happened a few years ago already, where you have a lot of devices. Everything that we have today is almost everything can be connected to the internet. Uh, we have smart refrigerators. I just bought in Home Depot a, um, a smart, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, heating, uh, like water heater. And it connects to my Wi-Fi, and I get an alert if there's a leak, or I can change the thermostat, the temperature on it. And that's great, but every device like that is a potential backdoor to a hacker and think about it. How often do you think the, the um, water heater company will deal with securing their, their built-in Wi-Fi on their water heaters? And how do you think they deliver that security if they found that there was a breach or whatever? How would you know about it after you already installed it? Your, your smart refrigerator or the, the stovetop or whatever, everything is Wi-Fi these days, but you don't get those updates and security patches once the company finds out that somebody was able to hack in. So how does the fish tank thermometer manufacturer was able to deliver the security patch after this incident happened? Those are the type of conversations that the world has today when everything just connects online. Another pretty nasty uh, source is uh, your friends. And there's a, a thing they call the popcorn time. That's a ransomware that circled around for years now. And it's kind of brutal because you, let's say you get infected and you get your device or your data uh, held ransom. So the the hacker, the bad person will tell you, hey, you can either pay you know $75,000 to get your pictures back or your client data back or whatever it is, or you can infect two of your friends and we'll give you your data back for free. You just have to send your friends the email here with the link. They're going to click on it. You will just tell them you don't know anything about it. You got hacked or whatever it is. You need to infect two other people. We'll give you your data back. That caused a lot of people to find who the real friends are, I guess. Um, another weird one. Um, I, I didn't know if I should put uh, an image. I love images on slideshows and less words, but uh, I wouldn't put a chastity belt image here. It's not appropriate, but can you imagine having that device hacked and, and again those are devices that are controlled wirelessly you can control it from your cell phone and uh, there's a lot of toys that we're not going to talk about right now that are all internet connected and are not secured imagine having all of those um, breaches happen so i want to tell you a quick story of um, how social media can actually cause uh, some annoyances and um, and scary stories uh, some of you might have heard it i, I saw some um, familiar names in this uh, on the Zoom meeting here. I presented to your group before, and a couple of you might have heard that story. But I want to I want to share it in case you don't know what it is. So there was this couple that got engaged, and um, they 
loved their honeymoon. They went and, and just like any other person in the world today that wants to show off how much money they have or how good their life is and lie to the rest of us as if everything is perfect. This couple went out and um, splurged themselves and, and just had a great time and took pictures of everything. And they posted it on Instagram, on Facebook, whatever it is. And, um, and they just want to share stuff with their friends and make people jealous, I guess. When they landed back in the U.S., um, the guy, let's call him John, John got a phone call and it was um, the manager at the Marriott Hotel that they stayed in their last destination. And the Marriott manager said to John, John, I'm, I'm glad you had fun. It was great seeing you. Congratulations again on your marriage, on your, uh, yeah, your honeymoon. And um, I, uh, unfortunately, we had a water bottle that we tried to charge. It was missing in the mini bar. It's only $3. We couldn't process your credit card and um and we need your card and you know john is not going to argue at the end of a beautiful honeymoon and he just gave the credit card online to obviously not anybody from marriott so simple quick example of how much uh, money could be ripped off from you and how much uh over posting people do and it, and it, and it might not be you even I know with my life, I don't post much of what I do. I don't think anybody cares what sandwich I ate yesterday and, and all that fun stuff. I brag about my kids sometimes, but that's about it. Uh, that's my personal uh, Facebook account, for example. Uh, but my wife loves to do a lot more than that or used to until I spoke to her and told her not to. And um, sorry, I guess I should probably disconnect all of my ringing things over here. I apologize. So... It might not be you, it might be your spouse, your child, your whoever that love to post stuff about where you are, what you've done. And, and all of that information can easily be um, used by the bad people. So something to keep in mind. Again, the title of our presentation today is how to keep yourself secured. There's no 100% security, as we all know, but each one of those pieces of advice should get stuck in the back of your head and start slowly thinking about it more and more if uh, if you want, of course, and uh, save yourself a lot of time, money, and headache. So there are a couple of uh, very scary stats over here. Uh, if anybody knows, if you have a copy of the slides, you're cheating right now. But uh, if you had to guess how many ransomware attacks happen every year, um, the numbers are pretty scary. We're looking at 1.7 million a year, which is about 19 per second. And the problem with that is those are old numbers. It's probably pretty a lot more than that these days. And the average cost for the business in 2023 was 1.85 million. And this is not just um, big corporations. They, they lose a lot more. But when you think about it, it's not just the ransomware cost as well. You know, you think about the loss of productivity. Um, you have to deal with your own lawyers. You have to deal with the insurance company. You have to expense the IT side of things. Um, reputation is a huge thing for a business, especially a law firm, to lose client-sensitive information, et cetera. I am aware that a lot of the information that bankruptcy attorneys deal with is public record, but it's not all public record, and it's not always something that you want the rest of the world to be able to see um, in the middle of you helping with a new client or you just started helping somebody and you got breached and their information is out, all of a sudden the whole world can know that, um, you know, they know how much money they have or don't have and what they go through right now with the divorce that they're part of, whatever it is, you are under the same scary stories to listen to like everybody else. Now, why should you care besides that? I really believe, as I said before, that you really can't protect yourself from something unless you know what that something, something is. Um, I, I don't know if my, uh, uh, point behind this is clear, but you have to you have to know where you're going in order to get there. You have to know um, what medicine to take before you get better. You don't just pop pills. You know you need to know what you're fighting against. So there is this reason, and there's a reason, obviously, of of the professional uh, conduct and the ethical ruling that we need to worry about as a, you need to worry about as attorneys. Um, there are the obvious 1.1 and 1.6. There is a 4.4B. That's something that if you're not sure what it is, I recommend that you look at and, and understand a little bit deeper. And uh, opinion 477 for 
Uh, there's a lot of blurry area in your industry, unfortunately. Um, our clients that are in other industries like the uh, financial, you know, we have, we have SEC compliance and we have HIPAA compliance that tells us a lot more specifically what to do, when to do it, how long the password should be as minimum, whatever. In in your industry with the ABA, there's a lot of blurry areas. And what a lot of your uh, peers are doing is they're relying on either uh, hopefully honest IT providers, or they just go by what their insur cyber insurance uh, liability uh, policy will be dictating or asking them to do. So you need to know that you need to take at least reasonable, you make you may you have to make at least reasonable efforts to protect your customer information. And it is your responsibility. That is the bottom line over here. A lot of attorneys just say, oh, I hired an IT company. I don't care. I mean, the, if something happens, I'll just sue them. It doesn't work like that. It just, you will suffer just as much if you can bl pass the blame to somebody else or not. Um, depends on your IT company or your cloud provider. They have usually pretty solid master service agreement or release of liability forms that you signed initially that will release them and rightfully so because there's so much that an IT company can do for you or a cloud provider can do for you. They cannot protect you from your own mistakes. They can help you understand what those are or how to prevent them. But ultimately, it's up to you to protect your data, protect your firm, protect your clients. So artificial intelligence, um, I think that every presentation today should include at least a couple of slides on it. Uh, that's what the world seems to think. I think it's a huge hype that uh, is great, but uh, I don't want to go too much into details here, but I can tell you that hackers do use AI in ransomware attacks. And, and let me just show you real quick how they do that. Uh, on the penetration side, they collect information and analyze a lot of data. Uh, for example, they will uh, get into your network somehow or before they get into your network, they will collect information about you from social media posts, from your website, from your bio page, from um, uh, Avo or from whatever it is, any, any information that you put out there is gathered if somebody wants to attack you specifically. And they can combine a profile, like a little uh, snapshot of who you are, where you've been, where you're from, and all of a sudden, they know your favorite team or your favorite uh, or where your daughter plays soccer at or or any information like that, because that information might not be posted by you specifically. But again, your spouse might post that or your kids or whoever. So they collect information and they start crafting emails based on that. You know, um, hi, this is... Uh, um, I don't know, this is uh, Mary from so-and-so church that you happen to go to or the synagogue that you go to, uh, or the mask, or I don't, want, I don't want to get into politics over here. So you get the point though. Um, this is so-and-so from this religious entity that you're part of. And um, I saw that you um, attended our event a couple of weeks ago. I want to thank you. And I want to ask, do you mind just donating $3? We're, we're asking everybody just for $3. Here you are giving a credit card because... It's a legit phone call with a caller ID even of your church or your synagogue or whatever. It's easy to, to fake those as well. So that's the prep side of it. And then um, they send those personal emails for you and, and the success rate goes way high if they specifically mention facts about you that are true because those are facts that are out there. They're going to automate the process to identify and exploit vulnerabilities, uh, meaning they will find loopholes in your system once you download something, once you, um, uh, you know, once you have uh, opened a link or uh, or a document or whatever it is that they send to you, their system is going to start uh, exploiting your system, and um, it is basically the beginning of the attack itself. They're going to then uh, take a look at all the information. One of the first things they look at, and and it's funny because I I. I still feel sad that people do that, especially educated people that probably heard that a thousand times. There are still people that use an Excel document or Word document for everything related to their passwords. If you're one of them, please don't share with me. Just give yourself a huge smack on the wrist and change that immediately. Uh, we'll talk about password managers very soon. 
Um, but that's one of the first things that hackers would look at, would look for. They would look for any Excel or Word document that has the word secured, passwords, logins, anything like that in the name or the content, or a structure of a document that has email address, string of characters, and a URL. That's how we all save our logins for stuff, right? Or at least some of us do or used to. So they're going to look for that information. And sometimes they're going to just pull that one file away from your computer and they're going to maybe even delete their virus or their ransomware because they don't need it anymore. They're going to start attacking you from outside. Now they have access to everything maybe. So again, um, that's another thing you can do to prevent some uh, potential uh, attacks this year. And uh, you're looking also at the fact that they will maybe sit on your system, which is something they're known to do, to be doing, they might sit on your computer or your network for a week, three weeks or whatever. If your system, your antivirus on your security system didn't find them immediately, it will most likely not find them in the next week or two. And now they have two weeks to analyze information, see who's, where are you sending emails? What is your signature looking like? Who do you send emails to? What is the content? And then they can start faking emails on your behalf from your computer, from the cloud or whatever it is to your real clients with your real signature, asking for simple something with a case number or or um, whatever, anything that they already the client already knows to expect from you. Now a hacker has all that information and now it's such a real email from you, hypothetically, to the client. So they use that information and they continue moving across. Uh, they're gonna try to infect other computers, other devices, and um, they will make sure that they uh, exfilt exfiltate uh, a, a, as much as possible, as soon as possible, right when things are starting to be a little bit obvious. So they stay low for a while and then they just go crazy and, and will start working with uh, as much damage as possible. They're using AI at that point to also negotiate with your insurance company. Mm -hmm. um, the, one story is that there is the, the Big Mac ransomware, which is a uh, how it's called, where the hackers uh, determine the amount of ransom that they're going to ask from you based on the cost of a Big Mac in your zip code. Because some areas have a lot more income, and if you live in a place like Beverly Hills, for example, or the Hamptons or whatever, most likely Big Macs are not as cheap as they are in potentially Harlem or whatever it is. So the, the hackers are measuring that using AI, using that information, how much money it's potentially worth it for you, how much can they get out of you. And again, I, I wanna make sure that you understand that there is our, those are just ways where hackers can use some AI for some of their benefit. And obviously, People like us and the white hat hackers and, and the security professionals out there use AI also to protect from AI attacks. And this is some ways on how we do that. Um, we basically send fake emails to our clients. That's one of the things we do for all of our clients, like uh, uh, fake phishing emails to see which user actually clicks on those links. Why? Because we wanna be able to educate those users and, and, and those are the weakest links for us at that point. And we, figure out uh, anom anomalies uh, with your network. For example, our system can tell uh, what's a normal behavior. Do you open usually 30 to 50 Word documents a day? That's the normal. Now, if all of a sudden our antivirus or anti-malware software recognizes that there's 300 emails open in one hour, now we know there's a problem. So it will shut down the processes, it will isolate the machine, whatever. So there are ways around it and it's all AI based. There's no more antivirus program like AVG and Kaspersky that you can just install it and every two or four hours download the new definition file and you're good. Protection has to be related to behavior today and not just technological knowledge like zeros and ones basically. Now, um, who are the threats? Let's go over some of them. And by the way, I don't, uh, I cannot monitor the chat. I don't know if anybody is asking questions. I'm a typical male and I cannot multitask. So if you have any questions, um, I don't know if anybody wants to uh, jump, if Danny want to jump on, I'm happy to answer, but um, I'm going to be happy to answer questions at the end as well. I am so, monitoring the chat. So folks, if you have you. questions, please post. Thanks. 
So who are the threats these days? So we have um, the hacking collectives. Those are ethical hackers, you know, people that might uh, do it for a good reason to help prevent hacks. But then if somebody gets into their system or they lose their laptop with all the findings that they have, this is a threat, unfortunately. Next, we have the Internet of Things hackers, just the Alexa and the fish tank we were talking about, the thermometer and the water heater in my garage and all that fun stuff. Another threat source is the ransomware developers. Obviously, those are people that create those uh, actual ransomware attacks. We have the, uh, the nation state, obviously other countries that uh, don't really like us for whatever reason. Uh, gangs, mobs, all of those uh, uh, bad people locally over here. We have uh, inside threats, 21 billion lost every year in secrets. These are employees of a company. These are a frustrated uh, spouse of your paralegal that you haven't given a raise to for six years or you promise something and you did not deliver. You call them during vacation for an urgent issue. Their spouse now, now is pissed off. They're pissed off. Their kids are pissed off, whatever. And all it takes is somebody to be a little pissed off at you and they can cause a lot of damage. I'll show you in a moment how. Um, we have the script kiddies. These are um, uh, startup programmers that uh, might play with some of the technology. They're not uh, really, really aware. Maybe they don't really know what they're doing, but they play around and that happens a lot, unfortunately. Um, hacktivists, I love that uh, word. And we have the, um, the model developers. I'm not really sure uh, why I have that kind of uh, uh, twice over there. Ransomware developers and malware, forgive me. And uh, cell phones, um, threats can come from your cell phone. There is something that's called smishing, um, SMS phishing. Smishing is very popular today because most people tend to get text messages and they look at them in way, in way less suspicion than emails. So somebody has your cell phone number, they might know you, uh, they must know you. So people click on some links that they got via SMS or it says something not really clear, you know, uh, you want this or um, can you click here? I want to get, I want to confirm your appointment with Dr. So-and-so. So you click on that link, your cell phone doesn't have the same antivirus program, the same mechanisms to protect you from fake websites, et cetera. There's a few other threat sources uh, like your vendors, for example, just like the thermometer in the casino or God forbid your IT company who has access to everything that uh, is on your network or your computers and they get hacked. So your vendors are a risk as well or a threat. And uh, existing or ex-employees, self-explanatory, your competition. Um, we've heard quite a few stories about people that uh, are not playing nice with our competition and they can easily infect them uh, because again, there's trust even with emails that are sent. You know, here is the latest uh, report about whatever. Click over here to download the information that we just got from the bank. And, and it might be something that you expect, something that you're not. Frustrated clients and um, your current IT provider. Unfortunately, there are people in our industry that play horribly not nice and um, will, you know, if you owe the money, for example, or if you disagree on um, something that you agreed on, now all of a sudden you get um, infected with something, coincidentally or not. Um, that's horrible, but it happens. Um, your previous IT provider wants to show you how much more, how much less secured you are now than you were before you fire them. And we have the um, uh, the vendor's own threats. Uh, so for example, if you're on Clio, TimeSolve, uh, any of the cloud solutions out there, even the programs like uh, uh any of you know my case and all of those even if you have them installed on your own computer and they're not up to date that can be a back door for some hackers to get to your system from an outdated system uh, program so those are all the not all by not mean by all means that's not all but those are the main ones that we usually want to remind people to look for um now if you had a breach uh, do you know what to do that's a very important question and uh the statement here is that it will happen to everybody. And the question is, are you ready for it or not? So here are a few things that you want to know whether you should do or not. So first of all, how do you know you had a breach? Um, is it just a virus? Did you lose information? Are they encrypting everything? Did they upload any of the data to their cloud, the bad people? Because if it's just 
damage locally and they encrypted your data or deleted it, it's not as scary as it is if your all your data is now uploaded to the cloud and will be traded in the dark web. Next thing is, um, do you have a written plan to refer to? And the, the, the funny or the sad thing is that many people do have a written plan of how to deal with the breach, but it is on a file that's on the same server that's been attacked right now. So there's no access because it's also encrypted. So this is another reminder to look for those things when you talk to your IT people. And do they have access to your Excel document and uh, all your files and stuff? Uh, so your passwords and stuff are on there. The, uh, the agreement, agreement with your client, do you have anything on there that protects you from any potential lawsuits um, if they sent you information that you didn't ask for, or you, add, you have information that they were supposed to download from your cloud and they didn't, do you have any agreements in place with your clients? Do you know what the breach notification laws are in Arizona? You guys are all in Arizona. Um, very simple. Uh, from everything I know, um, it might have changed, but as of uh, about three or four years ago, if you the way that you usually communicate with your clients is how you need to notify them in case there was a breach. So if you usually text 20 of your clients and email 50 other ones and um, send a mail, snail mail to the other 100, this is how you should at minimum communicate about the breach with them. So something to know about as well. Um, now, if you have a breach, what are you going to do? Who are you going to call? And the question is um, uh, really, is it going to be your IT company? at two o'clock in the morning? Is it gonna be your managing partner if you're not that person? Is it gonna be your insurance company? You have to have that plan in place. What do you connect or disconnect? And how do you know what data was breached, if anything? Um, maybe there's an alert from the antivirus that something has been uh, caught and nothing happened though. It's just the antivirus did its thing. What do you do? If you need to change your passwords, um, one of the other portions to think about is if somebody, if a hacker is on your computer and they have a keylogger installed, they can see every keystroke that you have. Are you going to use that computer to change all your passwords? Because now the hacker has all of your passwords again. So people don't think about that, unfortunately. And what password do you need to change? Do you really want to change everything? Do you want to go to your bank, which is maybe has nothing to do with that, your social media accounts, your uh, Microsoft account, Google, whatever, your personal Gmail account, uh, your spouse account? Again, we need to have a plan for that. Um, now, how did they get in to your system? And is the back door still open? Was it you that downloaded something? Or was it a, um, a router that you bought in Best Buy for $50 thinking that it's a good router for your business? And now that uh, $50 router is the back door and you cleaned up all your systems, even reinstalled all of your computers uh, after your insurance company told you that it's okay to do that. You're not tampering with evidence, but the back door is still open. So guess what's going to happen after 10 minutes again? Now, will your insurance cover the forensic side, the reporting side, the client damages, the loss of productivity, opportunity cost, PR marketing, reputation damages, um, the, the fines that you're going to get if you have credit card numbers stolen, social security numbers stolen? Each entry like that is a fine. It can be anywhere from a few dollars to a few hundred dollars per entry. So it is important to know what to do and, and be ready to, to dissect that piece of information as well. Now, quick question, um, true or false, you must ask clients before sending them email, a blanket approval. And uh, my dear friend, Linda Sheely told us once that based on uh, ABA opinion 11459, the answer is true. And um, if those are things that you don't know and you don't have a mechanism in place to add those kind of connect, um, processes to your onboarding process, which can be a simple paragraph in your uh, engagement letter with a client. Those are not hard things to do. You just need to do it. So quick story about my wife. Um, thank goodness she's not here today because I wouldn't have to uh, skip that uh, section, but she's really, I love her, but she's a horrible driver. And one of the things she does pretty horribly, unfortunately, is a, uh, She's one of those people that will change lanes. And then at the end of the lane change, when she's already on the new lane, she will start signaling. And uh, and that's going to run for about half a second. 
So, you know, the people that turn the steering wheel and then with her pinky, they just, at the end, they just click it. That's what she does. And um, the, 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 the understanding that she, I don't understand why she's doing it. And, and my point is, there is no point to that, right? If you cut off somebody and you cause an accident, that little half a second signal is not going to do anything. And after the fact, the fact is what we're worried about over here. And this is kind of like how you budget for cybersecurity. Cybersecurity budget is, is very clear for us as IT professionals. This is how it looks like before an attack happens. And as soon as somebody suffers or hears somebody that they close to, real person that they know that went through a cyber attack, this is exactly how people start budgeting for IT and, and for cybersecurity. And it's really sad to see that you are able to save a lot of that money and your insurance premium is not going to go skyrocket. And if you even get to qualify again for insurance after a cyber attack, if you haven't been protecting yourself correctly, keep in mind uh, a lot of investment, sorry, a small investment at the beginning might make a lot more sense than paying the damages later because it will happen. The question is how much damage it will cause you. I want to talk about the anatomy of the internet for a second. This is something that's a little bit uh, eye-opener as well. And, and we have the, the three sections. What was surprising for me to learn is that 96% of the internet is estimated to be deep and dark web. So on the surface, we have the regular websites that we all go to for news, for social media, for whatever. And um, a deep web is uh, the databases that are secured behind the password. You have to be a member to see. You have to be the patient in order to see your own records and and uh, log into um, um, all of those uh, databases that are hosted for you. Clio, everything that's on the cloud that's protected with a username and password is called the deep web. And then uh, the dark web is a huge portion of it. This is where the bad people hang out. This is kind of like the hood of the internet. And... Um, uh, this is really not hard to get in there. You basically just need a special web browser that's called the Tor, T-O-R. And once you download it, you, you should probably not do that. But once you get up that program, you can start browsing the, the, the hood over there and you can do a lot of bad stuff there. And, and I'm going to tell you in a second why I'm sharing that with you. So how do infections travel? How, do, how does ransomware travel? So the first source is usually the email that you'll get with some malicious links. And I'm talking fast because I wanna cover everything, but uh, you guys will uh, hopefully have the ability to just review those slides down the road and, and remind yourself what this weird accent guy was talking about. So emails that contain malicious links or attachments, websites that have an injection, injected code on them is another um, source of how to get infected. Um, uh, security vulnerabilities, your uh, operating system, you know, you all have to update Windows and app, uh, all the Mac operating systems. It's not just Windows, by the way, Mac OS is as well uh, a source for infections. But what most people don't think about is the, the extensions of the plugins, the add-ons on your web browser. Uh, if you open the web browser and you see all those nice little icons on the top right, all of those plugins that make your life easier, the Grammarly and all that stuff, those can those are programs that automatically run on your computer every time you open your web browser. They just run from the web browser, but they're still programs that you might not have any idea who is maintaining them, how secure they are. So again, something to think about as well. We were talking about text messages smishing already. Um, if somebody is sending you to a legit website, but there is a malicious code on it that routes you to a bad website, that you will never know because the bad website was programmed to look exactly like the original one. That's another issue that you want to think about. And um, malicious, uh, sorry, using botnets. Uh, this is where uh, people will bother you. Oh, not people, the, the bots uh, will uh, bother you, pop up some uh, alerts, um, some uh, recommendations for you to click here, click there. And, um, and send you some fake uh, messages, et cetera. Those are bots. Um, the easiest example is um, um, you post something on Facebook or Reddit or whatever. You ask a question, does anybody know of a plumber? And then a, botnet is gonna, uh, a bot is gonna come in and say, uh, yeah, here's a plumber. That's an AI that's not a real person, but here's a plumber. Here's the link for a fake website that will tell you for 20 bu bucks, we're gonna come to your house uh, tomorrow morning. Who's not going to want to do that? So you click on it, you give them $20 via credit card, and nobody shows up because it's not a real plumber website. 
And malvertisement, this is, um, again, uh, where ads are being hijacked on legit websites. So you go to msn.com or you go to yahoo.com and you have a thousand different ads on there. That's how they make their money from the web browser. Uh, but if somebody takes over those ads and send you with a great special deal to a non-legit website, it's a problem. This is a link I suggest you look at that will tell you, um, uh, give you a couple of uh, ad blockers that you should consider because there's no reason for you to see any of the ads on those websites as a way to block them for free or for a couple of bucks a month. Uh, check that out. And then uh, short URLs, you know, we all get that uh, bit.li slash whatever or tinyurl.com slash whatever. So instead of, so there's some legit reasons for that. Instead of sending you a link that is like 500 characters, you can use a, sh a free service online that's called the tinyurl.com, tiny, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L.com. That's one of many of them. You, you put the long URL and it produces a shortcut, uh, like a very short one, and you can send that via email to your friends or whatever. How do you know where that short URL is going to really? This is what this website can do for you that um, uh, check the URL one. Now, there are uh, very basic fundamentals with cybersecurity and there's a lot of different flavors to them, but really they're all the same at the end of the day. It's a lot about common sense and a lot, of, a lot about monitoring your technology and your security on a regular basis. But I'll give you a couple of examples. These are the 13 controls of the Association uh, of Corporate Counsel. That's how they broke down their own cybersecurity kind of framework. This is the CIS framework. That's a very popular one with small businesses. This is actually what we base our cybersecurity framework on. Then you have NIST the National Institution for Standards and Technology. Uh, this is um, how they break down cybersecurity in, uh, in different phases. Um, this is usually what most government contractors will have to follow and prove that they are complied with with this cybersecurity framework. Um, and what I want to share with you today very briefly is what we uh, decided, our company, to how, how we decided to break it down and I think it's a lot more user-friendly and you'll see in a second why. So we broke it down to the areas of the user, the company and the data. That's how the three areas that we need to protect in a business when it comes to cybersecurity. So let's talk about the user for a second. Um, what's going on? Okay, that might be a little delay here. So on the user side of it, we have a few sections. We have the section of uh, before we hire, and there's things that we recommend that you do before you hire. You know what? Give me a second. Let me stop this. Uh, I have a little issue over here. It's annoying because every time you have all this beautiful... Uh, transitions of everything. Things work like garbage when it comes to transitions, not after previous and not, with, come on. Did I mention that I hate uh, PowerPoint? Almost done, guys. Just gonna make things, I had the same issue yesterday and I just wanna fix it because it took a little bit longer than expected to go through these slides. Transitions, automation. I know I'm losing your patience right now, but bear with me. Okay, let's start on this slide. Okay, there you go, much faster. So this is on the user side. Um, I broke it down or we broke it down in our company here for four different sections before onboarding, while and at termination. A few things that most people forget to do um, is um, the technology and security assessment during the onboarding. Uh, you bring a new employee to the, uh, to the table and you need to know how knowledgeable or how big of a risk they are to you. Uh, this is something that should be no problem for your IT company to give you a link of a little test, assessment test for your new employees, for example. 
Um, you want to make sure that you introduce that new employee to your internal team and to your IT team. And same thing with termination. You want to make sure that you're notifying your employees, vendors, and your clients that the user is no longer there. Um, we want to make sure that uh, drop test, for example, or background check, if you guarantee to your clients that you are not going to employ any criminals or anybody with criminal history, yeah, you do a background check on the beginning before you hire them. But what if two years down the road, they, they're in trouble, they got some uh, issues right now, they haven't shared it with you. So ongoing background check is another thing that most people don't think about. So that was the user. Um, next thing is the company. Um, on the company side, we have uh, the understanding, we need to know who all of our vendors are, who have access to everything that we have in our business. Where are the logins for all of that? Who has, um, who has access to manage those things? The, the, the bigger issue we, we run into is where employee leaves your assistant, your paralegal that helped you set up your website or help you set up the, the emails on Microsoft, whatever it is, that person leaves and everything was under her, his or her personal email. And now you have to spend hours and uh, a lot of headache to gain access to those. So it's things to think about as well. Evaluate um, all of the vendors, uh, at least annually, I would say, how are you guys protecting my data? Uh, what's changed? Did you get any breaches I need to know? Or did you have any breaches that I need to know about? You want to verify that you have insurance, both e and and cyber liability. Very important today. And um, you want to talk to your IT people um, about security. What, what are we missing? What should we be doing better? A lot of IT companies are afraid to talk to you about what's out there, what your competition is doing to, to be more efficient. But more importantly, what is it that you don't have in place? Because we spoke to you about it three years ago. You said, no, I don't want to set up two-factor authentication. So we don't bother you since then. No, every time you meet with them, every time there's a need for you to hear something from your IT company, that has to happen on a regular basis. I'm speaking about you know firsthand experience over here, of course, who has physical access to your network, to your company uh, establishment, et cetera. And then on the data side of it, uh, we have some other areas, the... Um, uh, obviously the encryption and how do we dispose of data? How do we um, manage the wireless on our network? Who's doing inventory? Um, one of the best examples is um, we had, uh, we had went to a client, uh, it was a prospect back then. During the onboarding process, we found a drawer in uh, one of the employees, old employees desk that uh, had five external hard drives and nobody knew what those are nobody knew they existed even that employee is not there anymore and there was thousands of documents copied onto that ex those external drives and one of them was a complete copy of everything from the client server sitting in a drawer not encrypted not anything you need to have an inventory of where your data is what any device that can have either access to your data or already has data on it should be inventoried somehow so again those are the type of things you, sh you should probably consider looking at as a as a small business, medium business. I'm gonna skip that, that's a boring slide and more important things are to be discussed. Here's what we hear, um, I, you can call it reasons, I call it sometimes excuses, but um, it's reasons until something happens and then you will see that it's just excuses. Why you're not in compliance with what needs to happen these days. So a lot of people think that just because they have an IT guy that can fix their printer and um, configure Outlook with emails and they finished DeVry a couple of years ago is also the same person that should keep them secured with cybersecurity type of security. Um, that's almost always not the case. If somebody is not on getting ongoing training and investigate solutions and um, news about cybersecurity, you cannot count on them to protect you on the cybersecurity side. Uh, budget for IT is allocated, but people don't understand that IT and cybersecurity are not necessarily the same thing these days, unfortunately. You might say you don't have time to deal with that. Great reason, horrible excuse, and so on. Now, um, another mistake that we see is that uh, people think that because they're on the cloud, they are protected. Why do we even care about all that stuff? All of my stuff is on the cloud. Here are a few, a few reasons why. First of all, 
Um, you need to make sure that we assume that most businesses will use Microsoft 365 as their cloud host for their emails and maybe OneDrive SharePoint. I'm going to talk about that only as an example. So uh, it's very similar with Google. So Google and Microsoft both tell you that they are asking, uh, telling us that we need to come up with our own third party solution if we want to protect ourselves uh, from app application outages. They're also going to tell us that it's our responsibility that uh, in case of a ransomware, we need to have a third party backup. They write it on their uh, end user license agreement specifically. It is not their responsibility. They will protect themselves from what they're responsible for, and they're not responsible for recovering your stuff if you got infected. Same thing with uh, uh, deprovisioned user accounts. You know, somebody deleted an old user that you kept live on the Microsoft platform. Somebody, your IT company, whoever deleted it by mistake to save money, they did not back up that data. Microsoft, after 90 days, will purge that information. And all of a sudden, all the emails that you now need for um, the position, for proof, for whatever it is, uh, is gone. And you don't have a backup of it. Microsoft said, sorry, tough luck. Now, on the cloud side of it also, what about your local copy or your, your offline, your cache data? I can guarantee you that each one of you that has cloud storage like Box, Dropbox, OneDrive, SharePoint, any or Google Drive, you will not have only data on the cloud. You will also create the Word document most likely or Excel or whatever it is, or PDF on your computer, and then you upload it to the cloud, but it's still on your computer. So now you have tons of data that you don't think about that is not something that you want a hacker to get their hands on. So even if your cloud is protected with all the security that you need, the hacker is on your computer, they can still get from your computer to the cloud, but also all the data that's already on your computer, all those offline copies. Other things to consider when you want to protect yourself this year. Um, I'm not going to go over this whole list, but the second, first of all, the first two-factor authentication if you don't have it yet on everything that is offered, especially your Microsoft or Google accounts, please set it up. It's so easy. It's it's ridiculous not to do it. Email authentication, DMARC and Deking. This is uh, an old technology that's finally being forced by Google and Yahoo. And it's basically, it means that if you don't configure your domain name and your email um, mechanism, let's call it, correctly, your emails are going to be bouncing back uh, from reaching Yahoo and Google and Gmail accounts and many other spam filters out there. Um, in the next, uh, towards the end, in a few moments, uh, you're going to see one of my last slides over here as a QR code and a link to our website where we offer to do a completely free assessment of your domain name. It doesn't require you to give us any logins or anything, but take advantage of that because you will be very easily able to see if you're in good shape. And if not, it's very not complicated to fix it. Um, so besides that, DLP, data loss prevention, uh, somewhere in the middle of it there, these are rules that will prevent you from mistakenly sending sensitive information to people outside your organization. Uh, a document with social security number on it should not be sent via email unless it's encrypted and so on. So Microsoft, in this example, has very easy ways to automatically encrypt those or at least alert you and tell you that um, you should have sent it encryptedly, et cetera. Um, DNS filtering is another service that will help you. It will be a little bit annoying, but it will prevent you from reaching websites that you think are legit, but are actually fake websites or known to be malicious. Uh, there's, there are services out there that's called DNS filtering. Ask your IT company about that. Implement that. It's usually dirt cheap and has a huge layer of security. And again, a lot of other areas here that uh, if you have time to read um, the bring your own device best practices over here, this URL has some good bathroom reading material. And let's talk about encryption for a second. We have about eight minutes left and I'm going to promise you we're going to finish on time. Um, with the encryption side of it, we have uh, uh, three types of encryption methods that I recommend you consider hard drive encryption, file encryption, and email slash web traffic in encryption. And the goal is if you encrypt data and that data is stolen and you can prove that it was encrypted, 
you don't have to even report that. And I'll explain to you where it is, this one here. Uh, this is based on opinion 483. Um, you, if you can prove, again, you have to make sure that you can prove and you know for sure it was encrypted, you don't even have to report the stolen computer or the stolen data. I'm not saying that it's the only thing you should do, just encrypt your data and that's it, but it's definitely gonna help and it's really easy to do. Um, this is one, and again, encryption is something you want to talk to your IT company about if you're not sure what they're doing for you right now. Social engineering, another risk these days. Um, remember posting stuff on a, a restaurant that you went to, and now the bad actors are going to contact you on behalf of the restaurant, offer you a free $100 gift certificate if you just leave them a good review. I see that you were here two weeks ago, two days ago. I'm going to send you a link to just review, give us five stars. That's going to take you three seconds. I'll send you a hundred dollar gift certificate. This is so-and-so from your school PTO. You know, we need a donation for a bottle of water or for $5. All of those, um, you know, social engineering methods are still working a lot. Um, I'm going to have to skip a couple of things over here that you can read on your own, especially the email security tips over here. Uh, this is just reading, but I do wanna show you, um, those are some examples of emails from 11 years ago that are still circulating and people still fall for it. But when you get an email, which is the number one source of infected um, process of how people get infected, you need to look at the sender of the email. You need to make sure that um, if, you, if the logo looks right, I know you're not gonna look for the registered trademark like on number two over there, but you will see that um, if you hover with the mouse, if you go with the mouse over the link, don't click on it, just go, over, go with the mouse over a button. It will pop up and tell you where is the URL that it's gonna go to. If it's not FedEx in this case, you're potentially dealing with a fake email. Same with the sender, it's not coming from FedEx.com. Look at this example. We have um, same idea. Uh, we go with the mouse over, it's going to a fake website. Uh, the email is supposed to be from LinkedIn, but look at the sender address on the top. Here is another one from Spotify. Very legit email. I actually use Spotify. Everything is making sense over here. That came to me uh, a little while ago, but it came from a domain name that is not from Spotify. Um, that's great. Um, Amazon, we all... Uh, I assume we're all slaves to Amazon and, and have uh, the drivers stop in our house on a regular basis. Uh, at least I do. And uh, you can see the sender address again is not correct. Look at this one. Um, it looks very legit as if it's from Microsoft, but again, oh, sorry, QuickBooks, but it's not, um, the, the sender is not legit over here. There are so many examples all over the internet, but you can see the sender over here. This is a Microsoft email was supposed to be, look at the sender address. It's an earthlink.net, making no sense. So we're gonna talk about phishing websites very uh, briefly and explain to you that um, fake websites are have a very short lifespan because the internet authorities will take them down. So they're created very fast. Usually there's gonna be bad resolution logos and spelling, etc. Make sure that you see, look at the SSL certificate, you know, on the top where it's HTTPS on the address bar. It's important to look at that. Um, some fake websites will look exactly like you see over here. This is, there's no way for you to know over here that this is not a legit Microsoft login request, but it is not. Um, I can tell you it came from a fake website. So be careful looking at the address. Here's another one, Facebook. Um, the address bar is the only indication that's not a real Facebook site, facebook.com. Here is eBay. Looks exactly like an eBay login, but the domain name on the top, the address bar, is completely wrong. Um, this is an old pop-up. There's no more Flash Player, obviously, but if you look over here, the only indication if you get a pop-up like this is on the bottom here, the word uninstall, the second word from the last, from the bottom, bottom. Uninstall, it's spelled wrong. I mean, people don't pay attention to that and it's dangerous if you don't have any other mechanism besides the common sense out there. So you wanna protect your website as well because if somebody hacks into your website and injects some malicious code and causes your clients or visitors to download or give credit card information that doesn't go anywhere besides the web, uh, the bad people, it is your responsibility. So protecting your website is important. Your web guy should be somebody that might be able to do it, but it's usually an IT type of 
protection, not a website developer or designer that will do it for you. And there are lots of advices on password uh, best practices. We don't have time to review them all manually, but I can tell you that um, my advice is to never save your passwords on your web browser. Your web browser is not a secured password manager. A lot of people find it convenient, but they should not be doing it. I'm not going to read to you the slides over here, but I do want to tell you that um, there are a lot of uh, good points over here on this upcoming slide. It is running very annoyingly slow. Uh, adding one capital letter, for example, is a huge benefit to your security. And I want to share with you real quick what that looks like. Give me a second. Um, so over here, you can see I'm going to put in, uh, what is it? Log me in uh, 2024. Let's say this is, why is the caps lock open? Log me in 2024. Look how long it's going to take a hacker in, uh, this is pretty old information. It's way less than that. If you're going to put the L capitalized, for example, we move from few minutes to six days. And if we're going to add, for example, the word now, we're now to up to 40 centuries for that password to be uh, cracked. So going back to just adding the word now, but keep lowercase, everything lowercase, we're down to two years. So going from two years with one capital letter, we'll go for 40 centuries to crack that password. So again, uh, the, the length of the password makes a huge difference. Adding one capital letter completely helps as well. And there's some other pieces of information over here. Point is, long is better. 12 at least, 16 minimum, my recommendation of, of how long the password should be. And you're going to ask me, how the hell can I remember 16 characters, passwords? You can't. That's why you want to have a password manager. You'd never want to repeat the same password on different accounts. So how are you going to remember 500 passwords that are 16 characters? Again, get a password manager. We recommend a program called um, uh, Bitwarden. We used to like uh, uh, the one that's called uh, the LastPass. They got hacked like three times in one year. We moved away from recommending them. Bitwarden is definitely a good solution over here. Here it is on the slide here. You can check it out. There's a free version. There's a paid version. And you can definitely benefit from enjoying them. This is the... Um, QR code and the URL if you want us to take care of your domain uh, uh, free assessment. Again, we're not going to sell you anything. This is not how we run our business. Uh, some of you know already. I just want to help you guys understand where you are. That's why I teach those classes and, and try to help you out. And um, there's not going to be any sales annoyance after that. Scan this QR code with your phone. Go to that URL. Fill it out. I don't need any information from you. No logins or anything. It's all internet public information that we're going to use. And here is another cool video that we created. Um, if you scan this with your camera on your phone, this is a hacking demo that I did showing you how you can access somebody's webcam by simply sending them a Word document and convince them to click and open it. Um, it's just sad how easy that is. And that's my uh, contact information, galloptechgroup.com slash Bates. All my social media stuff is there. Uh, my email, if you want to reach out and ask any questions. And we are one minute over time. And um, I apologize for that. Actually, two minutes right now. But uh, considering we started about three minutes late, so I'm still in the one hour, I promised you. Absolutely. Any questions, guys? So you're welcome to unmute un yourself if you want to jump on and ask questions, or you can post something over in the chat. And I have uploaded the materials Bait slides I uploaded several times the last time a couple minutes ago, plus the CLE certificate. So questions? We're we'll getting positive. And, and one thing that I will personally uh, support here is that Bates is not a salesperson. Uh, he, he, he just loves what he does. And he's excited about helping people uh, in this rather unique area of technology that you and I are now living in. Um, so come on, let's get some questions.
everything was maybe so clear that nobody has any questions. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, good to see you. I say, I think you yesterday you also got uh, to hear my spiel over here, and I think you were uh, you had to cut early because of connection issues. So good to see you, Bob. It's been a while. Okay. Um, to Jeez. remind all of you, this has been recorded. It will be available both public and for our members on the website. So you certainly are welcome. I know Bates was very quick in what he did. Uh, and so sitting and watching it again and where you can actually put it on hold for a moment and assimilate and then move on, uh, that might be good. But we'll be posting the... Uh, uh, the video uh, on the ACBC website shortly. Jim, it looks like you unmuted yourself. Do you have something? Maybe, Maybe not. It's, it's an image or a video and it's not moving. Well, guys, if you do have any questions, um, again, I uh, my contact information is there. I'm happy to read to answer any questions and um, take advantage of it. If it's becoming too much and we need to make it more official in terms of our services, I will definitely let you know before it gets to that point. But um, let me help you get out of stay out of trouble if possible. Now I just reposted the CLE. A couple people said, "Where is it?" So it's on the chat. Uh, if you're not able to see it from the chat, all you have to do is email admin at acbcforum.org. So admin acbcforum.org and I'll be more than happy to ship you off a copy. All right. Well, Bates, again, you are my you are my savior. Uh, you know, happy to uh, I'm good so <laughs> pleased that you were able to present. Uh, I attended yesterday, and truthfully, I got more out of it today, getting to hear it again. Um, so thank you so very much for stepping in at the very last second for us. Yeah. We appreciate that. Happy to help. And thank you for everything you do. You're so involved with all this uh, legal community and you're involved with so many different um, associations and boards and education. And it's, it's just amazing to see people like you that just want to give back and, and help everybody. So you're awesome. So it's a Bates Diane Love Fest. Okay, everybody. You all have a wonderful weekend. Take some time off for yourself. All right. Everybody take care. Bye, Dan. Bye.